By all accounts, Simon Sinek should have been happy. He was young, he had his own business, he was making money, he had lots of friends. Everything should have been great in his life. But it wasn't. He, he found that he just was not that interested in what was going on anymore. He'd lost his interest in things and he was wondering what was wrong with himself. So he stopped and, and evaluated things and, and thought about it for a while. And, and what he came up with ended up being uh, one of the most popular TED Talks of all time. In fact, he wrote a book about what he discovered and he's written five more books about what he's discovered. Here's what Simon Sinek came up with. He put it in a diagram so we could understand it and have a look at it. What he came up with was what he called the golden circle. Golden circle is, a, is three circles that uh, radiate out from one another and uh, he said everybody's life revolves around three certain things. We want to know what we're going to do. We want to know how to do it. And we need to know why we're doing it. What Cynic figured out was that uh, he had the first two. He knew what he was doing. He was running an ad agency. He knew how to do it. He had companies lined up and he knew how to make ads. He knew what, how to do it. He had forgotten why he was doing it though. And so he closed down his ad agency and went back to discovering his why. Why am I doing these things? Why am I doing what I do? And then he went on to do his TED talk to tell people that you need to find your why. That if you find your why, everything changes. The other thing he discovered was that most of us work on the outside edges of this rather than the inside. So think about a party. When you walk up to somebody for the first time, what do you ask them? Well, you ask them their name, you ask them, where do you live? What do you do? You ask them what questions? Um, he said, we need to get to the why. In fact, everybody who's ever changed the world has learned this, has known this, has done this. They've worked from the why out. So think about things like this. 1962, John F. Kennedy stands up at Rice University in Houston, Texas and says, we're going to the moon. Uh, the interesting thing about that is he had no idea how they would do that. At that time, NASA had 15 minutes of space flight under their belts. That's all they had. Alan Shepard had done his one flight and it wasn't even an orbital flight. He just went up and came back down. But after 15 minutes of that, Kennedy stands up and says, we're going to the moon. Why? Because it'll make America great. We'll learn some really good things. Oh, and by the way, we'll beat the Russians. That why overcame everything else. Because they had a really strong why, they went through all sorts of effort and all sorts of problems and they didn't let anything stop them until they accomplished what they wanted to do. They had a why. The next year, 1963, Martin Luther King Jr. stands up in Washington, D.C. Uh, on the National Mall and 250,000 people show up to hear him say, I have a dream. That's a why statement. He said, something's got to change. Something's got to be different here. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know all the steps, but I know something needs to change. I'm here because of a why that says we need something else. So people went through all kinds of grief to try and see a change come because the why was big enough. My kids need a different future. That's the why. Um, if you want a more Canadian example, most of you will remember this guy. 1980, Terry Fox, after losing his leg to cancer, decides, you know what? I'm going to go raise some money. In fact, I'm going to run across Canada. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a marathon a day until I get some money raised for cancer research because cancer needs to be solved here because it's affected me and it's affected lots of other people. His why was big enough to make him run until he was done. When you find your why, then you figure out the how and the what. The why drives everything else. 
If you don't have a strong why, if you don't have the strong motivation, if you don't have a solid core, then the how and the what, you might get those things right, but like Simon Sinek, you don't enjoy it. You don't like it. It doesn't mean anything. So when I saw that TED talk and when I started thinking about these things, it made me think about the church. What does the church do? I don't know where your experience is. I don't know what experiences you've had, but let me tell you what I've heard. I've heard a lot of what sermons in the church. I, I've heard a lot of sermons that say, this is what we do. This is what we say. This is what we believe. This is what we act like. This is our what. I, I've heard some how sermons. When we get really serious, we talk about how. We talk about how we worship. We talk about how we read the Bible. We talk about how we honor God. We talk about how we live our lives. We get a lot, a ton of what and how sorts of sermons. I'm not sure I've heard a lot of why sermons. And, and I have no research to back this up. I don't know that this is true. I do know this is true from research that that uh, kids who grew up in the church, by the time they're 18 years old and go off to university, 70% of them quit. That's true. Look it up anywhere with any, any denominational group. That's true. 70% of our kids don't make it. They give up as soon as they get away from home. And I have no research to back this up, but I'm wondering if we haven't given them a why. I'm wondering if maybe we've given them lots of what's. You go to church Sunday morning. We've given them lots of what's. You do say this and you don't say that. We've given them a few hows. This is how you're baptized. But we haven't told them why in a powerful enough way that makes them want to keep doing those other things as well. I don't think we do this intentionally. I don't think it's something that we've, we've done maliciously. It's just the way we've done things. And if you think I might be wrong about that or being too harsh, just look at the way we teach the Word of God. A really good example comes from 2 Timothy, which we've been going through for the last several weeks. And we're at the end of chapter 3, start of chapter 4 this time. So if you have a Bible, just look at this and I'll show you what we normally do, at least what I've experienced, what we normally do with 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4. There are two really... Uh, famous and well-known passages in here. The end of chapter 3 says this in verse 16, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All scripture is God-breathed. It's inspired. And so ever since I was a little kid, I've been taught that this is the inspired word of God and we need to honor it and we need to hold on to it and we need to, we need to teach it as if it's inspired, not just words of men, but words of God. I love that. I think that's true, especially in a day and time where people are attacking the Bible and saying it's just full of prejudice and a bunch of old stuff that doesn't matter. We need to hold on to the inspired word of God. But when you think about it, that's a what sermon. By, by saying that this is the inspired word of God, you've told me what it is, but you haven't told me anything about why I need to do something about it. That's how chapter 3 ends. Chapter 4 starts with an equally well-known passage, an equally famous thought, and it says this, chapter 4, verse 2. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct Rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For a time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. I've heard that passage a lot as well. 
And it was given to us at Bible college. I've heard it at almost every Bible college um, graduation ceremony. We love that verse. Preach the word. Go tell somebody something. Give them the truth, not just what their itching ears want to hear, not just what they want you to say. You stand up and tell the truth. Preach the word. You know what? That's a what? That's a how statement, actually, isn't it? If, if the first one was a what statement, this is the inspired word of God, then we've just focused now on a how statement. How are you going to use this word of God? You're going to preach the word. You're going to be ready in season and out of season. You're going to tell the truth whether people like it or not. You're going to defend what the truth says instead of telling people that is all a how statement. So in this little passage, we focused really closely on those two things, on the what and the how. But interestingly, we've skipped the why. We've skipped the motivational part. We've skipped the part that would make Timothy do those things in the first place. And the interesting thing about that is the why statement is right between the two that I just read to you. Between the end of chapter 3 and the passage in chapter 4, we get the why. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says this, In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. The end result is preach the word, but the why, the motivation, the part that makes him want to do this, the part that makes this other part real, is in view of the fact that we live in the presence of God and Christ. In view of the fact that there's a judgment coming. In view of the fact that God, Christ is going to reappear and the kingdom is going to come, now go preach the word. That's his why. And I want you to think about these whys for a second. Because maybe it'll help our motivation as well. Maybe it'll make us get going as well. Maybe it'll help us find why we should be doing what we're doing. Think about what he says. Maybe we haven't taught verse 1 because we've often it sounds threatening to us. We've heard it in a threatening way. Oh, there's judgment coming. You live in the sight of Christ and God. You, there's a kingdom coming. In fact, when I started reading this the first time, I did hear it as a threatening thing. And I thought, well, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to teach this? But listen to it again. These aren't threats at all. These are actually the precious things that are going to make Timothy do exactly what Paul had done. Because this is what motivated Paul, and it was going to make them do exactly what Jesus did, because it's what motivated him too. Paul says to Timothy, In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, his first motivator is that he's not alone. You are, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ. Again, when I first read that, I thought, man, that sounds sort of ominous. That sounds sort of scary, but it's not scary at all. It's not that God is looking over your shoulder and he's going to get after you if you don't do something right. And now you're going to have to go and do some good work because God's going to be mad. Otherwise, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying you're in the presence of this mean, awful guy. He's saying, Timothy, you are in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. You're not alone. You have your father with you, Timothy. That's why you're going to go do this. You're not doing this by your own strength. You're not doing this by your own power. You are doing this in the presence of God. With his help, with his guidance, with his care, with his power. You're in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, Timothy. What a beautiful thought. I was thinking the other day, just trying to come up with a parallel here. Um, I taught both of my girls how to change oil in their cars in this garage right behind me. My girls didn't know how to change oil in their cars when they first started to do it, so I stood there with them. I stood over their shoulder. I said, take out this drain plug with this wrench. And I said, 
jack up the vehicle this way and I said take the filter off like this and put the drain plug back in this tight not any tighter that's okay no put this on put some oil around the ring on your oil filter first and put it on fill it up this way here's how you get rid of the old oil my girls would never have changed the oil in their cars by themselves they never would have tackled it they would have just paid someone to do it but because I was there because I was able to guide them because I was giving them reassurance that they could actually do this because they were in my presence then they did it themselves and I think that's what Paul's telling Timothy here Timothy you're not alone you're in the presence of God and Christ Jesus therefore you can do whatever you need to do that's his first bit of motivation that's the first why you have help you're not alone he goes on from there and says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Again, that sounds a little threatening, doesn't it? There's a judgment coming, Timothy, so you better get to work. I've heard some people use that as our why. Some people have used that to say, Well, you better get to work because Jesus is coming back and you're going to be in trouble if you don't. That is a why. It's not a really motivational one or a good one doesn't really make me want to do anything. Fact of the matter is, there is going to be a judgment, and we need to preach that. In fact, that's one of the things I have not heard preached very much lately. We don't talk much about judgment anymore, and we really ought to, because it is a fact. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 tells us that uh, all will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and receive... Um, the reward for what they've done in their life. That's what we're told. Again, that's not a threatening thing for Christians, at least. Um, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 tells us that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're not in trouble at the judgment. But we need to know that there is going to be a time when Christ re reappears and he is going to judge our lives. He is going to see what we've done. He is going to evaluate how we spent what he gave us. And, and again, that's motivational, that's okay. But it's not motivational in a threatening way, but in a very positive way, because the promise here is, is that you have only one judge. That's what Paul, I think, is trying to say to Timothy here. He tells him, you've got the word of God, the inspired word, and you need to go and preach, Timothy. But I want you to remember, in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Timothy, you have one judge, and that's it. And you know what? That is actually a very freeing thing. When, when I realize that I only have one judge, then I'm free to do things properly. Um, it allows me to do things well. It allows me to do what needs to be done. With this whole COVID thing, um, everything has changed for us, right? Uh, I used to preach to 80 people on a Sunday morning. We used to record the sermon and maybe 10 other people would watch it if I'm lucky, right? Like nobody watched this. But in the last four or five weeks, uh, these lessons have gone all over the world. There's people all over the place watching them. 200 times people click in to see these things and who knows how many people are in each of the groups watching in those 200 times. And so it's easy, it's tempting then to start thinking and worrying about what I'm going to say. It's, it's tempting to start thinking about, well, how, how am I going to teach this? What am I going to say that doesn't make this person mad? Or how's that person going to hear it? Or what am I going to say so that people like me? What am I going to say so that people think I'm doing a good job? What am I going to say so that people don't argue with me? What am I going to say that makes people want to come back again next week? Those are completely the wrong questions and they're the wrong motivations and the wrong whys. What, what Paul tells Timothy is, Timothy, there is a judge and he's going to judge the living and the dead at the end of time, but there's only one of them. Jesus will judge how we've done. And so when I keep that in mind, then I'm emboldened to do what I need to do, say what I need to say. When I was first in Estevan, I was 21 years old. 21 years old, I had no life experience. I didn't know anything. And yet, 
every Sunday I got to stand up in front of these people who had been Christians for a lot longer than me and who had had a lot more life experience than me and I got to stand up anyway and say something. Why did I get to do that? Because I wasn't saying anything for me. I was saying what this said. And if you wanted to argue with anything, you're going to have to argue with this because I'm not teaching me. I'm teaching what I'm told to say. I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please the one who will judge me at the end of time. And, and so isn't that what Paul is saying to Timothy here? He's saying you're in the presence of God in Christ Jesus, and he's going to judge. Therefore, preach the word, Timothy. Be prepared in season and out of season. Don't just say what people want you to say, because they're not your judge. They might seem like it at the moment. They, you might be trying to please them, but that's the wrong motivation. We have one judge who will judge us, and we need to please him. That's our motivation. I need to do something so that when Christ returns, he looks at me and says, you spent your time well. You did what I asked you to do. You were faithful. Timothy, that's your motivation. Thirdly, he says to him, you're in the presence of God. Christ is going to return one day and judge the living and the dead. And he says, you're also doing this in view of his kingdom. In view of his kingdom, Timothy, preach the word. I like that thought, that he says, Timothy, there's a kingdom coming. You're not home yet. You're not home yet. We spend a lot of time building our own little kingdoms, don't we? We spend a lot of time planning for the future and piling up assets and counting how much money we have and thinking in how many years it is until we retire and wondering if we've got enough and, and uh, trying to impress each other with what we have. We like building our own little kingdoms. And I'm not saying all of that is bad. You need to look after your family. You need to be wise. I don't want you just being frivolous and throwing things away. But we spend a lot of time building kingdoms that don't last at all. As James said, or you're just a mist or a vapor. You're just here and gone. Even the most powerful of us are just here and gone. I, I We have a member in the congregation uh, he and his wife ran an auction company and and one of the things that just fascinated me time and time again when I worked with them in the auctions is that we'd go out on a Friday and we'd gather up somebody's entire earthly possessions and throw them in a couple of trucks and we'd haul them into Estevan and starting at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning we would start selling their stuff and by three in the afternoon four in the afternoon it's all gone Everything that person had worked for, every earthly possession they had, boom, gone in less than five hours. It's just gone. We like to think that our house is our house, but you know what? I'm looking at my house right now as I'm recording this, and this house will be somebody else's house someday, unless it burns down or something. Someone else is going to live in my house. It's not really my house. This isn't really my garage. This isn't really my patio. This isn't really my home. Paul says to Timothy, in view of Christ's appearing and his coming kingdom, go and do what you are charged to do. That's his motivation. That's his why. Timothy, why are you going to care about this? Because you're not home yet. There is a home being prepared. Jesus said in John 14 that he's going to prepare a place for us. That it, That's being readied right now. God's kingdom is here in a partial way. We get to feel some of its benefits, but the kingdom is coming. The rule of God is coming. Eternity is coming. Therefore, Timothy, that's your why. That's why you need to care about this. That's why you need to preach. That's why you need to try. That's why you need to participate. That's why. That's his why, because the kingdom is coming. You know, I like the idea that Paul encourages Timothy to think big picture, because that's going to be his why. We as a church need to teach 
the what and the how. We need to teach people what to do and how to talk and how to respond and turn the other cheek. All those other what and how things are great. I'm not denigrating that. I'm not saying that's not worth doing. But what I'm saying is, is that if you give somebody a whole bunch of rules and ways to live and things they ought to do, without giving them a good reason to do it, it'll never work out. If you want to make me mad, come stroll into my office someday and say, you know what you need to do? Oh, I hate that. Don't come tell me what I need to do. Tell me why I need to do it. Tell me why this is important. Tell me why this would make a difference and then I'll be on your side. Give me the big picture and now you've got me going. But if you just tell me what to do, you're not likely going to get the response you want. And I wonder if that's why we're having trouble when it comes to teaching other people and even our own kids. Maybe we've forgotten to give them the why. Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells a story about a man who was going on a journey. And so he gathers up his servants and he says to each of them, here's some money. I want you to do something with it. Two of the servants went out and decided, you know what? My master's probably coming back and he's probably going to want to uh, find something good has been done while he's been gone. So I'm going to go do something. They were motivated. They had a why. The why was my master's returning and I'm gonna to have to give an account. And so they went out and they did some things. They invested his money and they doubled it. And when he comes back, they were able to say to him, look, master, here's what you've given me and I've got this much more. And the master looked at them and said, well done, good and faithful servant. Why are they good and faithful? Not because they'd earned extra money. Doesn't seem like the master needed the extra money. They're good and faithful because they stuck to their why. They understood what they were supposed to be doing. And then they went out and figured out how to do something. There's one other servant who didn't do anything. He, he was so scared he'd get it wrong that he buried his talent in the ground and did nothing. And the master calls him wicked. You missed the point. You lost the vision. You focused on the wrong thing, you forgot your why. Paul says to Timothy, you have a great important job to do in Ephesus, Timothy. And so I want you to remember that you're not alone. You're in the presence of Christ and of God. I want you to remember that you only have one judge to be accountable to, so do what he would like you to do. And I want you to remember that this isn't your kingdom. The big kingdom is still coming. The big blessing is still coming. Live for that. Those were Timothy's whys. And once Timothy got those whys figured out, then he would figure out the, the how and the what. He would figure out what to do to make those why things work out. Brothers and sisters, do you know why you're doing this? Have you told your kids why this means something to you? Have you told your neighbor why this is important? Why? We've got to find our why.